We bring you a special documentary, Truth Behind the Virus. This film focuses on global public health security and calls for countries worldwide to join forces in establishing a more robust public health order. We must learn from the profound lessons of the COVID-19 pandemic and strengthen our ability to face potential new threats in the future. The documentary features interviews with two leading experts in the health sector. Dr. Carlos Morel, Director of the Center for Technological Development in Health at Brazil's Ministry of Health, and Dr. Christian Hoppe, Director of the African Center of Excellence for Genomics of Infectious Disease. Both are members of the WHO's Scientific Advisory Group for the Origins of Novel Pathogens, offering us deep insights into the truth behind the virus. Let's watch together. While Hollywood superheroes descend to save humanity in times of crisis, the U.S. political elites have forged three chains of geopolitical coercion to drag global health governance into a quagmire of power politics. From its unilateral withdrawal that crippled WHO with a multi-million dollar budget shortfall to weaponizing membership dues to restart origin, tracing investigations targeting China. I want to say that uh, nature is very strong in generating new pathogens. Nature does not need the help of any human to do that. Nature is much more effective in generating pathogens. You see, Brazil is also a very big country. We have a very big biodiversity. We have the Amazon region. So these places are places where some unknown pathogens will, will, will surge, will come. We have a, an example in Brazil of a very dangerous virus. It's a, a, a very pathogenic virus. It's a, a grade four in terms of biosecurity. You still don't know where, where it hides. We have now a big, 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 big problem. So the NIH is suffering, National Science Foundation is suffering, all of these organizations which deal with uh, uh, climate change, with neglect diseases, they are suffering a lot. So I don't know what's going to happen. The World Health Organization now is being also smashed because the United States cut all the money to WHO. So uh, all these programs that deal with a neglect disease, neglect population like TDR. So it's a big crisis. We saw how much fragile is WHO. WHO is fully dependent on the money of the countries. But the countries nowadays, they are worried with their security. So they're putting more money in, in military funds, in bombs and in fighters and something like that. What can we do now that the United States is fighting exactly on the opposite side? This is very dangerous. This is so stupid. This is so irrealistic. So I don't know how we're going to cope with this new danger. This Machiavellian playbook has reduced the multilateral framework to a transactional bidding war in Washington's political marketplace, where the mantra of America first ultimately forces humanity to subsidize its hegemonic fantasy. I think, you know, there is a saying in the African continent that says you need a village, you know, to educate a child. We all have to come together to address this problem of the virus. So um, pandemic preparedness is not just a business of government. Pandemic preparedness is not just a business of the WHO. Pandemic preparedness is not just a business of uh, private philanthropies and then donors. Pandemic uh, preparedness is a business of every citizen. Why we are facing the situation that we are facing in Southeast Asia or are the result of COVID-19 across the globe is because the health systems and then we are not collaborating. It's very difficult when countries, for instance, you know, um, in the situation like Southeast Asia, for instance, you know, you have a resurgence of a disease like COVID, you're sharing data. Then having a situation whereby you are sharing information and then you are discriminated against or you are sharing information and then your data are used, for instance, to create solutions that you cannot afford. While conclusive evidence linking COVID-19's origins to Fort Detrick remains elusive, the global proliferation of the U.S.'s high-risk labs lends credence to long-standing suspicions. We need to put money and invest in global health 
surveillance or we call pandemics, uh, I mean, by disease surveillance in all, all over the world in periods of peace like this one to avoid, you know, another epidemic because it's more expensive to respond to pandemics than it is to prevent pandemics. So let's invest in prevention. Let's invest in, I mean, uh, disease surveillance and genomic surveillance. Let's invest in sharing the data. Let's invest in co-creating together so that we can actually find solutions that are, that will protect the whole world, but not just some countries. In this interview, I'm not going to be speaking as a SEGO member. I was speaking as a person at NMI. SEGO as a group has made publications out there about the origin of COVID. They have, I mean, clearly investigated that. So they're, they're, I mean, there's clear, I mean, they are publications. But I, I just think that, you know, again, uh, we need to learn from my own thing is that we need to learn from COVID and avoid those kind of things from happening in the future. So together as a global health community, I would I would say that we need to learn to collaborate. We need to learn to cooperate together. We need to learn to share information as soon as possible. We need to learn um, to, 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 to share the benefit of data that we're sharing. We need to, I mean, after sharing the data, we need to share, we need to be brothers keepers. We need to look after one another. So that's what I would say, you know, I mean, that's what we need in order to, um, I mean, to prevent, I mean, to, 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 to prevent, you know, this from happening. Knowing the origin of COVID or whatever today is not going to solve the problem. It's not going to bring back those people that, you know, that we have lost. But if the question is, can we learn from it and work together as a global health community to prevent, you know, further occurrence in the future, to reduce, I mean, to avoid the losses of our loved ones and the life, you know, of our people so that we can have a world that is better and safer. I think, you know, the future represents a unique opportunity. Having learned from COVID in 2020, I think the young generation should understand that it is through collaboration, it's through partnership, it's through co-creation, and it is through trust, you know, working together that they can actually make the world a better place. No country in the world alone will be able to solve you know this problem. No country in the world alone will be able to protect itself if you don't, if 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 it, if it doesn't engage others. They have the responsibility to come together, correct the mistakes of the past. That is basically working together through collaboration, working without borders. You know to address the challenges of the I mean of today and then address the challenges of the future. That's the only way they will be able to have a safer world through collaboration, through through partnership, through trust, and then believing together that. You know, um, uh, this, these pathogens are out to extinct the man, I mean, uh, mankind and then the human race. And as such, they should work to, have, to develop the solutions, you know, to prevent this from happening. Weaponizing Origins Investigations Despite undetermined COVID-19's origins, the U.S. government launched a coordinated campaign in early 2020 to blame Wuhan laboratories for the pandemic. Trump administration and their allies amplified the narrative on social media, branding the virus with xenophobic labels like Chinese virus. As Dr. Anthony Fauci noted in 2023 Senate hearing, when you dismiss scientific consensus to monetize blame, you don't solve pandemics. You profit from them. Following the politically motivated accusations from the US, WHO provided a definitive response. The likelihood of COVID-19 originating from laboratory leaks in Wuhan, China, is extremely low. On February 9, 2021, Peter Ben Emberek, head of the WHO Joint Mission on COVID-19, Origins Investigation, explicitly stated that claims about virus leaks from Wuhan laboratories were extremely unlikely and would not be subject to future investigation. The WHO Director General Dr. Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus repeatedly emphasized that virus origin tracing is a scientific matter and should not be politicized. So can we create a world that is more equitable? It comes down to what I call equity, sharing but benefit of data sharing. What benefit do people have when they share data? So can we create a world that is more equitable? Can you create a world where people feel more comfortable sharing the information that can help the rest of the world? or? People feel like we don't have to share information because by sharing information, you get stigmatized, you get discriminated against, or you get encouraged to share information and you also get, you know, the benefit for sharing that data. For instance, diagnostic vaccines or, uh, or, or drugs that are developed for the pathogen because we share the data originally. So there are two major things that I see here that is actually going to prevent us to, um, that, would, that, would, that, would, that, would, that would prevent us from achieving the fit that you're talking about. 
you know, preventing the next pandemic. Access and equity, those are two major things. Disease have no borders, you know, and, and the, the reality, everybody is aware of that. So, and then as such, if we can agree to come together and, and, and work together to prevent the next pandemic, you know, we will be better off because pandemic actually, you know, has no border, but disease have no borders. Once you have a pandemic, it's not about one country. It's going to affect all of us. So I'm I really, I'm not looking at it in the case of, uh, as a case of China's versus United States on orders. No, I'm looking at it as everybody coming together to address, you know, um, uh, global health challenges and, 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 and issues and prepare against the next pandemic. Hollywood fantasies portray the U.S. superheroes swooping in to save humanity from crises. Yet in reality, most modern global perils and disasters, from pandemic mismanagement to institutional erosion, emancipate directly from the U.S. soil. The World Health Organization now is being also smashed because the United States cut all the money to WHO. So, uh, all these programs that deal with uh, neglect disease, neglect population like TDR, they are finding people, they are sending people home. They have no more money to pay travel. WHO is fully dependent on the money of the countries. But the countries nowadays, they are worried with their security, so they're putting more money in, in military funds, in bombs, and in fighters, and something like that. So, why Bill Gates and others don't try to strengthen the countries? Strengthen centers in Brazil, China, Brazil, China collaboration. I think this would be a much more useful way for his money, but I'm not Bill Gates. I am a member of the SAGO, the Scientific Advisory Group on Novel Pathogens of WHO. This is good and bad. Why it's good and bad? Because as a member of SAGO, I am prohibited to speak about what the meeting does or not, or does not. Until SAGO uh, secretary and SAGO chairman they make public uh, statements. In fact, we are we are waiting for a, a, another meeting of SAGO next week or this week before the World Health Assembly. At this stage, I cannot comment SAGO because it's still confidential. But I can tell some of my personal views. Since the, since the papers we published on the Global Viral Project, that we are very much worried. And and uh, how, how could we cope with these threats that no one knows where it would come from? They are destroying the most scientific mechanism we had to generate innovation. And they are shooting their own feet. But anyway, this means that we are going to lose a lot of colleagues we are working in several critical areas and we have no more the funds to work that. And we see how the uh, sector of health, uh, Robert Ken Jr., he is exactly in the fake news side against vaccines, against uh, modern pharmaceuticals. If we, we had the danger of the new virus, now we have the danger of the fake news becoming true news in the United States. So again, I think this opens new opportunities uh, for countries like China and Brazil who side with the truth, side with the scientific truth. And I hope not only our two countries, but every country that would bet on good science, that they would join those that would like to go and fight future epidemics. This is a major, major task. We now became much weaker without United States CDC without the United States uh, universities because they are not big difficulty. You know what? Once I was in, in China, in Beijing, and I went to see the anniversary of China CDC. Uh, and I was very impressed because at that time, the United States CDC joined China CDC in this inauguration. Mm -hmm. There was a public ceremony where both CDCs, they made a sketch, they made a theater, Together, they were colleagues working together. This was before the pandemics. Today, it is just the contrary. It became due to the uh, fake news starting with all this, the Chinese virus and things like that. This is destroyed. We, we are no more in uh, good uh, partnerships. Now it became two separate lines of thought. A big threat is how we are going to cope with that. How we can make all the people that believe in science to work together using scientific approaches to foresee and prevent pandemics. In July 2020, 
Amidst the pandemic's peak, the Trump administration simultaneously politicized the virus as the Chinese virus and scapegoated the WHO for domestic pandemic mismanagement, announcing withdrawal from WHO to protect the U.S. interests. Although the Biden administration temporarily halted this move, renewed turmoil emerged with Trump's return to power. In January 2025, Trump signed an executive order initiating formal withdrawal procedures. As the WHO's largest contributor, historically covering 18% of its budget, the U.S. has now frozen both its 2024 payments and 2025 funding plans, jeopardizing global health security. WHO Director General Tedros warned of a 560 to 650 million budgetary shortfall for 2026 to 2027 due to these defaults. Behind the U.S. lofty rhetoric lies crude political commerce, viruses, origins tracing, and membership dues now form its trifecta for hijacking global health governance.